continue about with the practical use of the primitives I discussed yesterday, uh, deterministic and order preserving encryption uh, in practice. So I already mentioned that uh, despite the seemingly like very weak security of the schemes, practitioners were eager to use them, and as you would have said, because they naturally fit uh, the practical needs and the applications of search on, on the cloud. So, kind of one major application, uh, as you noticed, as um, implementing the proxies intermediates between the companies and the cloud storage providers, uh, who, again, as I mentioned, do not want to do any changes. They just want to store the data um, and search on the data. And so the, there are several companies, and Sky High Networks and Cypherbase mentioned uh, here on the slide. So they are, they exactly, I can say they doing what the original Navajo startup uh, did, even though their main focus was on order preserving encryption, but the same goal, uh, how basically implementing these proxies uh, who would do encryption on behalf of the cloud and send data on, to the cloud and then later decrypt and return it uh, to the server. Uh, so I was actually working, well, I was consulting for Sky High Networks, so I know a little bit more about what they were doing. And I must say, so I was very pleasantly surprised by their very, very, very cautious, careful approach from the very beginning. Like, I also talked to some other companies before, and um, they really didn't care to understand the subtleties of cryptography, the probable security guarantees. They, but Sky High Networks, they put a lot of effort. It's kind of part of the selling point, surprisingly, that they use uh, academic research, not some ad hoc schemes, uh, and uh, they really wanted to understand what is provable security, what guarantees do we have, and when they learned that these primitives, deterministic encryption and other preserving encryption, uh, so they're not very strong, they still wanted to use it, but then they decided it's very important to also convey to the clients that the guarantees are not uh, that strong. And they asked me to write some very informal <coughs> paper for practitioners uh, explaining the risks, uh, and actually several, and we're still writing some another paper uh, about this. Again, very informal, useful for practitioners. So, I was pleasantly surprised. Still, I'm kind of, I'm not sure uh, all that what we explain will really reach the customers. Uh, and I'm still kind of very, not that happy, even though like some of my design is, can be practically used. I'm still a little bit scared. But at least uh, I like the approach. But this is unlike, and I mentioned, CryptDB, this is not about for cloud computing, this is just for uh, protecting arbitrary relational database uh, system. So it also used uh, all the preserving and deterministic encryption, but as I mentioned, they, they never put any warnings in their work, uh, and that, that is really scary. They just, you, they just say they use some probable secure schemes. Um, Okay, and so there are, there are, there are other works like um, uh, this minus system is about entering confidential data in the 
mobile applications. So slightly different uh, application, but the same idea. Uh, they want uh, the data be searchable, and but they want to use the same search algorithms without any change. So they need to encrypt. Um, they still use a, the same idea, using a proxy to use deterministic encryption and not preserving encryption. Okay, so this schemes needed to be used and they are used um, and somewhat not surprisingly uh, here come the attacks. So this year at CCS conference this year there were two papers <coughs> published with experimental results attacking the systems using deterministic uh, encryption on, or the preserving encryption. So and these are the two papers I will discuss. Inference attacks on property preserving encrypted databases, mm -hmm. Navid et al, uh, and leakage abuse attacks against searchable encryption by cache et al. Okay, so I will talk about the inference attack paper first. So, and by the way, most techniques, pretty much all techniques in both of these papers are very, very, very simple. Um, so they pretty much don't use any deep math or crypto, uh, but the results is, is what's impressive here. And again, I'll mention, so, why it's not surprising, but at the same time, the, the papers uh, got some buzzes because, yes, it was known to pretty much, everyone understood or should have understood that, yes, statistical attacks should be possible because deterministic encryption leaks equality or the preserving encryption leaks at least order and that's not very strong and something should be possible, but no one really, before this, pretty much the, there was some other paper, did practical attacks showing exactly on some practical data what can be leaked. And that's why uh, it's not that surprising, but very important and timely, I think, that these attacks come. Okay, just first, like the results, like what, uh, what this paper did and first what this paper did. So, using again, as I said, very basic techniques and, such as frequency analysis, known forever. Um, so, they, this paper worked with uh, CryptDB. So, CryptDB, a relational database, I'll talk about uh, briefly how it works, but it's just the relational database where the fields can be encrypted with deterministic order preserving encryption. So, and they worked with real data, uh, electronic medical records. Uh, so, and I'll talk about where they got it. So, but it really contains real patient data from 200 US hospitals. And so then I said, fields are encrypted with deterministic encryption or the Brazil encryption. So for deterministic encryption, uh, they were able to recover, so for more than 60% of the patient's record from more than 60% of the hospitals, they could, they just recovered the, the values, okay, the plain text values. And for the preserving encryption, and this were used for certain uh, fields with numerical data, for example, age and disease severity, uh, for more than 80% of the patient's records from 95% of the hospitals. So pretty much broke all of all data. Okay, so in a little bit more details, uh, how did that attack works? Again, as I said, very simple, no deep crypto analysis. 
very basic properties of deterministic encryption and other preserving encryption leading to frequency attacks. So this we already know, deterministic encryption leaks equality, right? So if we have a field, let's say age, uh, with some numbers, and uh, when encrypted with deterministic encryption, the same plain text go to the same cipher text, then if we had like six and four equal plain texts, then we'll have six and four equal cipher text. And all the preserving encryption leaks equality and order, right? So this we know. If we if one plain text greater than the other, cipher text will be greater than the other. And if it's smaller, the cipher text will be smaller. So that's pretty much what they used from order preserving encryption. If you remember when I discussed uh, the specific order preserving scheme, or like any order preserving scheme, leaks more, it leaks relative distance. I mentioned the bounds imply half of the bits is leaked, most significant bits are leaked. These, uh, so this paper didn't use any of these. So it just assumed that the order is leaked. Therefore, their attacks uh, also apply to the stronger notions for the revealing encryption and uh, would all, so also work for the interactive encryption, I think so, because so only the order leakage they needed for their attacks to work, nothing more. I wonder why they didn't use the known more leakage. They could probably uh, break it even further, but they didn't do it. So once again, so their attacks apply to any order preserving encryption and also stronger encryption schemes allowing query search, which satisfy the stronger IND order CPA too. And uh, they, their attacks uh, didn't, even, didn't even need uh, queries to perform. And they didn't use the access pattern leakage, uh, but the, the next paper will use that. Okay, so just a little bit about CryptDB. So it's the first uh, encrypted database system. Uh, it, wa it's, uh, it was developed by MIT researchers, become very popular, was featured in the Forbes magazine, got many references, so cited very highly. So why is it popular? Again, convenient, uh, so seemingly provides security with very low overhead that is efficient. Uh, no major changes and supports large of class of SQL queries, so something sounds very useful and convenient. And it is, it's just security is an issue. <laughs> okay, can be, can be used for uh, encrypting medical data too. So, and allows for queries with the exact search queries and for uh, range queries, for example, finding uh, patients where age is smaller than something. Again, here's the order preserving encryption can be leaked. Okay, it can be found. And the doctors can recover the records, but the server will not know what's stored, supposedly. Okay, so uh, CryptDB discusses that there can be very, very sensitive data, but then it should be encrypted with the traditional randomized encryption scheme, that, but then it will not be searchable. But then some fields which need to be searchable, depending on what search it is, if it's just exact match, then they should be encrypted with deterministic encryption. And um, 
if, uh, if they need to be sorted and range queries need to be answered, then they should be encrypted with order preserving encryption. So depending, uh, it's the client decides which fields, what functionality you need from which fields and when, and then the corresponding primitive is used. So don't, like, these slides I borrowed, like, uh, and I mentioned from the authors, and I, they say they use deterministic encryption for sex, and I would just expect two fields. I don't know. I, I, I'm confused what's going on. It's, and it's everywhere. Like they say, quality is leaked. So the quality of sex should be leaked. And I don't know how many. Yeah, I didn't quite understand what's going on. Okay. Yeah. So it it's CryptDB is known to. Uh, it's actually uses the notion of encrypted onions where the same plain text can be encrypted in a sequential manner with various encryption schemes, but when you need certain functionality, uh, layers can be peeled off to the needed. For example, if we want to do keyword search, then you remove the more secure layers and leave deterministic encryption on top so you can make keyword queries. And the same if you want to do uh, range queries, then you peel the layers still, or the preserving encryption is there and do this, okay? So they use some other types of encryption, but what's important, there are layers you can peel to where you would just have deterministic encryption or order preserving encryption. And that's what's important for the attacks. And again, okay, it's clear that equality and order is some information leakage, but what does it mean for a practical application? And this is what this paper did. So electronic medical records, that's what kind of the go-to application of cloud search. This is data which definitely needs uh, security and sometimes even by law it needs to have security. That's what people care about. So it's a good choice uh, of the practical data. And uh, by the way, I think, I think they'll mention uh, that they used uh, real patient data was released for research purposes uh, but they had, they had to sign the form that it will be only used for research purposes and uh, they, they shouldn't try to de-anonymize the paper, try to infer any patient names, but other than that, other research is possible. Um, okay. Yeah, so this I mentioned already. So they... Um, they actually, uh, it's not known that CryptDB was used to encrypt this type of data exactly, but they just imagined what it would be. So they to took the valid data and encrypted it for the same way CryptDB would do. Okay. And this paper did inference attacks, uh, which is, uh, kind of a more general term than just frequency attacks. So what's the difference is that it's a basic statistical attacks, but which use some auxiliary data as a reference. Okay, and they emphasize they didn't try, even though the techniques they used can be used for de-anonymization of the data, uh, they didn't do uh, any of that, but they just tried to break the fields it's the, of the database. So the data they use, they use the target data, the database they were trying to break, uh, and this data uh, was 
some real data. As I said, that's controlled access day, uh, but a lot of data was available with, uh, but they, they had to sign special forms how it will be used. As auxiliary data, they used uh, completely publicly av available data from Texas uh, hospitals, available to everybody without control access, but they didn't have as much attributes as a reference in the database, as many fields as they wanted. So in addition, they used the data very similar to the target data, just uh, with different hospitals and from different years. Okay, so what did they do? So first, deterministic encryption. So very, very simple attacks. So let's say uh, we have the database contains records for different, for various patients and let's say a uh, number of days patients stayed in the hospital are encrypted. So there are repetitions and they just count. They just look at the ciphertext and they, at the ciphertext encrypting the number of days stays in the hospital and they just count how many do we have. Okay? And uh, that's easy to do. Uh, oh, I apologize, so that's some inconsistency. Then, so I, I will just tell you, they just sorted from the uh, most uh, frequent ciphertext to the least frequent ciphertext, no change, they sorted, okay? This histogram. And then they look at the auxiliary data they have where they, so they know exactly the plain text, but Nothing is encrypted, but they, they can do the same. They can look at the most uh, frequent ones, they sort it, and they just do the correspondence. They, they see, uh, sometimes you have to, there is a tie, you can break it arbitrarily, it can go either way. Uh, and then, so here on, in the auxiliary, these are the real number of days they know in the auxiliary data. And that's allowed them to decide this ciphertext must be encryption of one day stay. And this ciphertext, because it occurred so many times, have like the next number of times must be encryption of two and so forth. That's it. So, and that's uh, how they recover the plain text. So any questions here? So very, very simple. They just see what is the most pre frequent ciphertext. Uh, they see the auxiliary data, what's the most frequent plain text, and guess this must be the same. Okay, so may, it, it may not work exactly, but the, they show that the probability is very, very high that it works. They also do, try to do the same using a more sophisticated technique, uh, so LP optimization attack, it's a new family of attacks as opposed to the frequency analysis, which was very old. Uh, so what's the difference? They're trying to do the same, so this is the same database. So again, they start with counting uh, the number of occurrences of ciphertext, and, and they sort. Um, and... Oh, actually, no, no sorting here yet. So no sorting, they just compute it. Then they uh, take the auxiliary histogram, um, also look at the occurrences of the known plain text. And then instead of sorting in correspondence, so if these are, these are we just take from the previous one the, the right columns, we, we want to find uh, the right correspondence, but to do this, we compute L, so and P is a parameter here, it's L2 distance is computed between these. Uh, then they compute the total mapping cost. And then they're trying to minimize this cost and for the minimum cost possible, that will be the right correspondence. 
because if this is the right correspondence, then the total mapping cost will be this, so this is the minimum. But they just use known algorithms to find the minimum mapping cost and then will <coughs> give us the ideal mapping. Okay? And they formulate this as a linear sum assignment program for which uh, there are known algorithms similar to uh, linear programming algorithms or Hungarian algorithm gives a solution and is somewhat efficient. And that's what it finds. So, and you, they show that actually for P greater or equal than two, uh, the results they got are exactly the same as what we will get with the basic frequency analysis. So they say don't, don't, they're not sure if someone can prove it that the results have to be the same, but they appear to be the same. Yes. Well, because uh, you mean the differences in the results or differences in? When you just compare the frequencies, why would there be? Oh, it's not the same thing, basically. Okay, so they're using two different sources. One is encrypted, one is not, and they're supposed to refer to the same data, but I mean, they might not. Yes, yeah, yeah, so uh, this auxiliary thing in, in both. It, in both approaches, frequency optimization attack, this is similar data but not the same data. They just hope that they should similar frequencies, but they don't have the exact same frequencies. Yeah, that's pro where. Because you are trying to break some new data, having as a reference some similar data, yes. So they did, uh, uh, they looked at many uh, and many attributes, uh, many types of attributes, uh, did similar type of attacks. Uh, and here is just the graph uh, of how successful uh, these attacks were uh, for different, uh, different fields in the medical database. Uh, so here, here we have the fraction of the records which were broken and here we have a fraction of the hospitals for which it was broken. So basically if we have a point here, it means that 60% of the records were broken for 50% uh, of the hospitals. And you see that for many fields, uh, so including, so we have sex, mortality risk, um, so for many, almost 100% of the records were broken, and for some, uh, it depends, but still, very, yeah, so we have an impressive uh, result using this very, very basic technique. Okay, so for sex, 100% of the patients, for 95% of the hospital, mortality risk, 100% again of the patients, for 99% of the hospital, um, and so there are other. So in 
that um, even though the technique is very simple, it's just the numbers which are the impressive. That's what got people alerted. Okay, so without the preserving encryption, again, just order is leaked, that's what was enough. Uh, so they used, again, very, very basic sorting attack. Uh, so they, so we just look at the database. Again, what if the patient stays in the hospital encrypted with other preserving encryption for range queries? We look at the unique, unique cipher text and we can just sort, <coughs> like, they're sorted, we can sort them in the lexicographical increase in order. Uh, and if, uh, assuming that the database contains uh, all or almost all of the plain text, then for the days of the hospital, they notice that majority of patients stayed for not too long, for a few days, uh, then you can get uh, a very good guess of what the plain texts are. So very, very simple. That's what's known, obviously, uh, and that's, uh, that's what, we did, what they did. So, but this attack works for what's known as dense databases when almost all data uh, is there. Uh, you may say that it's not always the case, uh, but to say for many practical data, it is in fact the case. But then obviously, and this I mentioned yesterday, it's clear that uh, when basically we say the ciphertext space very close to the plain text space, then you can't expect any security for the order preserved encryption. And that's just using this observation. Um, but when the data is not then dense, they still could do the attacks, but they used together uh, sorting and uh, using the frequencies together. So they, again, count the ciphertext, uh, sort from the most frequent to the less frequent, uh, then they just compute, so for each ciphertext, how many uh, occurrences you have like before it, uh, the CDF function, they do the same for auxiliary histogram, compare, uh, and the same approach using the Hungarian algorithm can give you the uh, best correspondence. And using this, Again, so let me give. For many, for many fields, 100% 100 uh, of the hospitals. And for many fields, still almost all of the records broken using these techniques. Okay, so before I turn to the other paper, I know freely, so, uh, the CryptDB people, of course, were very, very upset uh, about this. And it sounds like they were really mad uh, because they, very soon after this paper, they posted the rebuttal uh, their web pages on ePrint, uh, kind of trying to defend themselves and saying that <coughs> saying that some claims are not true, that that's not what they, what this paper did, that's not how the data is supposed to be encrypted with CryptDB. Uh, and they're saying that if the fields are sensitive, they should not be encrypted with deterministic or not preserving encryption, they should be encrypted with good encryption. But then I really like, try to, I, I couldn't really understand the point and, um, because 
that's the whole point of CryptDB is to provide security to sensitive data with search functionality, but then they're saying that if it's sensitive, you should not search, right? But then what's the point of the whole this, I really, I like, I couldn't see their points. <laughs> and uh, so if you're interested, so the, the rebuttal is on Iprint, and Seni Kamara has a blog who has, who has a follow-up uh, discussing this. And even though I'm the co-author of the, of the preserving encryption, uh, like, I'm here, I totally with the attacker's side, uh, uh, on this, and it's like I don't like CryptDB people denying own responsibility in here and saying that's not correct. Okay, so and then briefly about the the, the paper leakage abuse attacks. So this is about breaking searchable encryption when used to encrypt not relational database but uh, text documents, in particular email documents. And again, they used real data, publicly available emails from Enron employees, 2000-2002, which is available online. And again, the highlights, so the bottom line of the attacks um, shows that they have various types of attacks. Uh, some, um, some need some one known email, and in fact, like one email, uh, if you happen to know one email, and it's very likely uh, to know, then you can learn a lot from the, about the other encrypted emails uh, before you had no idea about. And also, even if you don't have any known email, still a lot can be on, and I'll tell you about this. And by the way, I like the name, so leakage abuse. Uh, it means that they, they take searchable encryption schemes, and it's not that this, this attacks the searchable encryption schemes can be probably secure. They can satisfy the security definitions. Uh, and these attacks do not go against it. It's just these attacks are allowed by security definitions. Because the security definitions say that nothing except some leakage is revealed, but some leakage unavoidable is needed for functionality. And these attacks work with just that unavoidable leakage by the schemes, which is needed for searchable encryption schemes. Okay, so the data set, as I mentioned, Enron emails. Um, okay, and then 5,000 keywords, 93 keywords per document. They also uh, use some other uh, email set, again, um, available. Okay, um, I thought that oh, I don't need much time, but no, I'm getting close. I can, can I have like 10 minutes? Okay, good. So, they actually not, this cash at all paper, they're not the first um, to do this uh, type of attack. There was a paper in the NDSS 2012 by Islam uh, who did somewhat sim similar empirical analysis, also working with searchable encryption or used for document and in particular email encryption. And so I'll, I'll tell you briefly about that. So what, without looking at this, just, a, just an intuition, if you know something about the documents, let's say emails being encrypted, and something about keywords frequencies there, or may, namely kind of co occurrence of keywords. Let's say it's about, uh, so they have an example, if it's about baseball league, and then if you know that New York Yankees are the 
it's the set of three keywords which is most frequently occur in any document together. So if you know that, and then if you observe several queries being made for several keywords, uh, and you know that access pattern is leaked, and this is true by most searchable encryption schemes, what does it mean? It's just that for every query for a keyword, uh, you see which documents are returned. You don't necessarily know these documents, but you see that for each query, this document is returned, and for the next query, the same document is returned to, and some other document. You don't know anything about the document, but you see kind of the IDs or locations of this document. So just using that, the access pattern, like how many documents are returned, you can figure out, you just see like which queries return the most number of documents and you can, if you knew the most likely keywords, you know that these queries contain these keywords. But then again, looking at this New York Yankees, you would think that New and York are likely to be together in one document, much more likely than New Yankees because it doesn't make sense. And it kind of gives you idea to separate uh, here as well. So in general, so knowing, assuming the attacker has a lot of information about, uh, or some probabilistic information about the documents, maybe it knows uh, all documents and keywords somehow, or maybe what they say, what's needed is a knowledge of kind of co-occurrence of the keywords, if you know how likely any two keywords to appear in a random document, that's what will be sufficient. And then the attacker sees random querying being made, and maybe knows plain text at the line some of the queries, just observing the access pattern, uh, the attacker can figure out what queries were made for. So this is really about breaking uh, what is being queried for, okay? And it works, this is, works for more sophisticated schemes than just deterministic encryption. This works for what I mentioned, index-based schemes, right? When uh, we have <coughs> keywords and then uh, the list of documents, this is inverted index where they appear. And so keywords may be encrypted and the document it can be just identifiers or it also can be encrypted. And then the leakage, the access pattern is leaked. We just know for which queries, which document locations are being hit. That's all what's needed. So, and they show that this uh, can allow to recovery of the queries. And this paper, Cash at All from CCS this year, it just uh, builds on top of these attacks they just improve the success of this attack with a very simple observation that why don't we, if we know also and from some uh, searchable encryptions, you know that uh, the number of the documents, each keyword or some keywords located in, for example, here, if we see that the query three uh, matched three documents, and if we know that only one keyword is located in three documents and nothing else, we know it must be this keyword. So very, very simple observation. And using this, uh, this observation, they show that the previous approach can be simplified and the results, they scale better and the precision is better. And nearly 100% recovery. So it assumes quite some knowledge about the document set, but they say uh, it's not a stretch. Uh, it's not practical to assume that attacker doesn't know uh, about the document. And they also say that their attack performs better if uh, few information is known about 
the stored documents. You don't have to know it all. For the previous attack, you pretty much knew to know it all. Here, you don't have to know it all. Okay. And uh, they also uh, show, again, very, very simple attacks on somewhat weaker uh, encryption, searchable encryption schemes. And this is what uh, I mentioned. This is. This is, a, this is a simple approach to encrypt emails when you just take an email, extract all the unique keywords, encrypt the email with very strong encryption scheme, randomized encryption scheme, but then apply a tag, deterministic tag to each unique keyword, such as a PRF, at the end. And you can search by just applying the query, just the PRF applied to the keyword, and then the server can just find the same, the same tags and return the encrypted documents the user can decrypt. Okay, so this is, again, searchable encryption used in some systems. And again, trivial observation that, uh, and this is someone similar to known message attack. Uh, if you know one document, uh, then you can correlate you, and you find the same tags in the other documents, you learn the other keywords too. So very trivial observation. And they say it may be a difference, like some store the keywords in the original order, some permute them, in one case it's even more information is lifted. You don't permute them, but very trivial observation. And again, they run it on this known data set uh, using one uh, known email which was leaked and they found that many of the words were used in many other documents, many other emails. Yes, so just from one uh, known email, 35% of the words in every document were leaked. And in their paper, okay, so I, I, I'm not going to talk about it. They also have an analogy of chosen plain text attack. They say, what if it, it is practical to assume that someone can plant uh, a known document into the database system. For example, the, someone can send a malicious chosen email to the user and the user wouldn't know just what, like, store it in the encrypted form and uh, uh, the attacker can use this. And, yeah, the, this can lead to attacks obviously as well. So what to do about all this? So this is a real, real good question. And like we, we even last, we discussed, tried to discuss this before. So it seemed like for these data sets, medical data, emails, it seems it wasn't good idea to use uh, these searchable encryptions, but then are there other data for which it's okay? These attacks give some ideas what are the major weaknesses are, but it seems like they go around most of this and they work nevertheless. So are, are there real application of data sets for which it's safe? Uh, shall we say that we are not ready to use searchable encryption and the leakage is just too high uh, and we, we cannot do it currently unless there are the more secure schemes are more efficient. Uh, and uh, again, as I mentioned yesterday, we really want to leave it to the practitioners to assess the risks, but we are not at the point yet to just give them this responsibility if we don't know ourselves the answers, because it sounds like we don't really know this. So definitely, so I don't have answers to these questions, uh, but I think we as the community, we it's important to work on these questions and uh, there is something needs to be done definitely and I agree so um, 
I was at a workshop on searchable encryption this summer and we discussed all these issues and sounds like very important research question. We have to ourselves uh, study more and better understand the implications of security, unavoidable security leakage of searchable encryption schemes or for existing ones. Uh, we don't know how to compare leakages, we don't know how, because you can, there are different encryption schemes which say this leaks this, this leaks this, and it's not clear one is better than the other. How do they compare? What are the practical implications, implications of this? Uh, these attacks, they, as I said, they didn't contradict the existing security definitions. Uh, maybe we need new security definitions. In fact, for years I wanted like to have a security model which would work for something like RIMDB, which would take into account the queries uh, and uh, maybe some of these attacks will be taken into account or popped up earlier. Um, and maybe we can use some other techniques, for example, uh, information theory, and I'm currently trying to learn something in interesting, information flow theory, something uh, different, what seems very applicable, kind of the entropy type measures maybe will allow us to quantify uh, differently the leakage of searchable encryption schemes. Okay, so. Yeah, that, that, that's it for my talk, so a lot to think about. Um, yeah, thank you.